Uh, Ms. DeVos, many of my Democratic colleagues have pointed out your lack of experience in K-12 public schools. But I'd like to ask you about your qualifications for leading the nation on higher education. The Department of Education is in charge of making sure that the $150 billion that we invest in students each year gets into the right hands and that students have the support they need to be able to pay back their student loans. The Secretary of Education is essentially responsible for managing a trillion dollar student loan bank and distributing $30 billion in Pell Grants to students each year. The financial futures of an entire generation of young people depend on your department getting that right. Now, Mrs. DeVos, do you have any direct experience in running a bank? Senator, I do not. Uh-huh. Do you have you ever managed or overseen a trillion dollar loan program? I have not. How about a billion dollar loan program? I have not. Okay, so no experience in managing a program like this. How about participating in one? I think it's important for the person who is in charge of our financial aid programs to understand what it's like for students and their families who are struggling to pay for college. Mrs. DeVos, have you ever taken out a student loan from the federal government to help pay for college? I have not. Uh, have any of your children had to borrow money in order to go to college? They have been fortunate not to. Uh huh. Have you had any personal experience with the Pell Grant? Uh, not personal experience, but certainly friends and um, students with whom I've worked. So you have, have no personal experience with college financial aid or management of higher education. Mrs. DeVos, then let's start with the basics. Do you support protecting federal taxpayer dollars from waste, fraud, and abuse? Absolutely. Oh, good. So do I. Because now we all know that President-elect Trump's experience with higher education was to create a fake university, which resulted in his paying a $25 million to students that he cheated. So I'm curious about how the Trump administration would protect against waste, fraud, and abuse at similar for-profit colleges. So here's my question. How do you plan to protect taxpayer dollars from waste, fraud, and abuse by colleges that take in millions of dollars in federal student aid? Senator, um, if confirmed, I will certainly be very vigilant. Yeah, and I'm asking people, how. I, the, the, the how are you going to do that? You said you're committed. The individuals with whom I work in the department will ensure that federal monies are used properly and appropriately and I will look forward to working so, with so you. So you're going to subcontract making sure that what happened with uh, universities that cheat students doesn't happen anymore? No, I didn't uh, say You're going to give that to someone else to do? I just want to know what your ideas are for making sure we don't have problems with waste, fraud, and abuse. I, I want to make sure we don't have problems with that as well. And well, here, if confirmed, I will work diligently to ensure that we are addressing any of those issues. Well, let me make a suggestion on this. It actually turns out that there are a whole group of rules that are already written and are there, and all you have to do is enforce them. So what I want to know is, will you commit to enforcing these rules to ensure that no career college receives federal funds unless they can prove that they are actually preparing their students for gainful employment and not cheating them? Senator, I will commit to ensuring that institutions which receive federal funds are actually serving their students well. And, and so you will enforce the gainful employment rule to make sure that these career colleges are not cheating students? Uh, we will certainly review that rule. You'll and review see it? That, you and, will not and commit to enforce it, it? And see that it is uh, actually achieving what the, the intentions are. I, I don't understand about reviewing it. We talked about this in my office. There are already rules in place to stop waste, fraud, and abuse. And I don't understand how you cannot be sure about enforcing them. You know, swindlers and crooks are out there doing backflips when they hear an answer like this. If confirmed, you will be the cop on the beat. And if you can't commit to use the tools that are already available to you in the Department of Education, then I don't see how you can be the Secretary of Education. Um, how much information do you have about the finances of the President-elect, his family, or Trump-related organizations? 
I don't have any of that information, Senator. So I take it that you won't have any way of knowing when asked by the President to take official action in your capacity as Secretary, how those actions might affect his personal financial situation. I'm not sure I could comment on that. And this isn't theoretical. He owns a university. I think it's relevant to assessing the wisdom of an education policy proposal to know how that proposal might affect the President's personal finances. Do you disagree with me? Well, I think the President-elect has uh, taken steps to ensure Can, can I ask, do you, do you disagree with me? Is, is it? Can you, at, can you state your question yep. again? I think it's relevant to assessing the wisdom of an education policy proposal to know how the proposal might affect the President's personal finances. Do you disagree with me? Um, I don't disagree with you. Okay, thank you. The nation deserves a Secretary of Education who's a champion of kids, parents, state and local control, and outcomes. And I also think the nation deserves a Secretary who's a champion of public education. In a 2015 speech on education, you were pretty blunt, quote, government really sucks. And you called the public school system a, quote, dead end. In order to clarify, you never attended a public school, K-12 school, did you? Correct. And your children did not either, correct? That's correct. And you've never taught at a K-12 public school, correct? I'm not. Do you think that schools that receive K-12 schools that receive government funding should meet the same accountability standards, outcome standards? I, all schools that receive public funding should be accountable, yes. Should, should meet the same accountability standards? Yes, although you have different accountability standards well, between traditional traditional public schools and charter schools. But I'm, but I, but I'm really interested in this. Okay, should everybody well, be on a level playing field? So public, public charter or private K-12 schools, if they receive taxpayer funding, they should meet the same accountability standards. Yes, they should be very transparent with the information and parents should have that information first and foremost. And if confirmed, will you insist upon that equal accountability in any K-12 school or educational program that receives federal funding, whether public, public charter, or private? I support accountability. Equal accountability for all schools that receive federal funding. I support accountability. Okay, is that a yes or a no? That's a, I support accountability. Do you not want to answer my question? I support accountability. Okay, let me ask you this. I think all schools that receive taxpayer funding should be equally accountable. Do you agree with me or not? Well, they don't. They're not today. I, but I think they should. Do you agree with me or not? Well, no, because... You they, don't they, agree they, with me. Let me move to my next question. Should all K-12 schools receiving governmental funding be required to meet the requirements of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act? I think they already are. Okay, so... So, but, but I'm asking you a should question, whether, whether they are or not, we'll get into that later. Should all schools that receive if, if schools taxpayer funding be required to meet the uh, requirements of the individuals with disabilities in education? I think that is a matter that's best left to the states. So states might, some states might be good to kids with disabilities and other states might not be so good and then what, people could just move around the country if they don't like other kids are being treated? I think that's an issue that's best left to the states. What about the federal requirement? It's a federal law, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Let's limit it to federal funding. If schools receive federal funding, should they be required to follow federal law, whether they're public, public charter, or private? As the senator referred to... Um, Just the, yes or no. The, I've only got Florida, one more question. The Florida program. Uh, there's many parents that are very happy with the program there. I th and let me state this. I think all schools that receive federal funding, public, public charter, or private, should be required to meet the conditions of the Individuals with Disabilities and Education Act. Do you agree with me or not? I think that is certainly worth discussion, and I would look forward to So you to cannot yet agree with me. And finally, should all K-12 schools receiving governmental funding be required to report the same information regarding instances of harassment, discipline, or bullying? if they receive federal funding? I think that federal funding certainly comes with strings attached. I think all such schools should be required to report equally information about discipline, harassment, or bullying. Do you agree with me or not? I would look forward to reviewing that provision. If it was a court, I would uh, say to the court, let the uh, judge instruct the witness to answer the question. It's not a court. You're not under oath or you're not under a subpoena, but you're trying to win my vote. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Mrs. DeVos, there is a growing fear, I think, in this country that we are moving toward uh, what some would call an oligarchic form of society, uh, where a small number of very, very wealthy billionaires control, to a significant degree, our economic and political life. Um, would you be so kind as to tell us 
uh, how much money your family has contributed to the Republican Party over the years? Senator, first of all, thank you um, for that question. I'm again was pleased to meet you in your office uh, last week. Um, I wish I could give you that number. I don't know. I have heard the number was 200 million. Does that sound in the ballpark? It, collectively, between yeah, over my the years, entire yes. family, that's po that's possible. Okay. My question is, and I don't mean to be rude, but do you think if you were not a multi-billionaire, if you, a family, has not made hundreds of millions of dollars of contributions to the Republican Party that you would be sitting here today? Um, Senator, as a matter of fact, I do think that there would be that possibility. I've worked very hard on behalf of parents and, and children for the last almost 30 years to be a voice for parents and to a voice for students and to empower parents to make decisions on behalf of their children, primarily low-income children. Thank you. Uh, in your statement, your prepared statement, you say, and I quote, students should make informed choices about what type of education they want to pursue post high school and have access to high quality options. Some of us believe that we should make public colleges and universities tuition free so that every young person in this country, regardless of income, does have that option. That's not the case today. Will you work with me and others to make public colleges and universities tuition free through federal and state efforts? Senator, I think that's a really interesting idea and it's really great to consider and think about but I think we also have to consider the fact that there's nothing in life that's truly free somebody's going to pay for it oh, and so yes you're right and you're and right so somebody would, will pay for it but that takes us to another issue I think and if, that is if I may yeah. and that is right now we have proposals in front of us to substantially lower tax breaks for billionaires in this country while at the same time, low-income kids can't afford to go to college. Do you think that makes sense? Senator, I think if, if your question is really around how can we help college and higher education be more affordable for young people as they anticipate Actually, that it. wasn't my question. My question is, should we make public colleges and universities tuition-free so that every family in America, regardless of income, will have the ability to have their kids get a higher education. That was my question. Senator, I think, I think we, we can work together and we could work hard on making sure that college or higher education in some form is affordable for all young people that want to pursue it. And I would look forward to that opportunity if confirmed. Would you agree with me that if there is a mom watching this hearing who makes thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a year, single mom perhaps, who has to pay ten or fifteen thousand dollars a year for childcare for her daughter? That that is a burden that is almost impossible uh, to deal with. Would what are your proposals about making childcare universal uh, for our working families? Do you have ideas on that? Do you agree with that idea? Uh, that that certainly is a burden, and while and I I can understand the uh, challenge that that family that young mother would face in deciding how to best serve her child's needs. Again, I think if we're talking about the future of that child and their education, I would look forward to working with you. I know we have common ground on a lot of things, and we could find ways to work together to ensure that that young mom's child will have a great opportunity for a great education in the future. There are countries around the world which do provide universal, very inexpensive or free childcare. Would you work with me in moving our government in that direction? Senator, again, I, I feel very strongly about the importance of young families having an opportunity for good child care for their children. Um, I'm not sure but that that's But it's not a question of, of an opportunity. Department. It's a question of being able to, very often my Republican friends talk about opportunity. But it's not a question of opportunity. It's a question of being able to afford it. How do we help somebody who's making eight or nine bucks an hour at a time when we can't raise the minimum wage here because of Republican opposition? How do we make sure that those moms can get quality child care that they can afford? Well, I would look forward to helping that mom get quality, a quality education for their child or their children so that they could look forward to a bright and hopeful future. 
outside of grade level. And this is, uh, brings me to the issue of, of proficiency, which uh, the senator uh, uh, cited, versus growth. And I would like your, your views on uh, the relative advantage of measuring, uh, doing assessments and using them to measure proficiency or to measure, measure growth. Thank you, Senator, for that question. Um, I think if, if I'm understanding your question correctly around proficiency, I would, I would also um, correlate it to competency and mastery so that you, each student is measured according to the um, advancement that they're making in each subject area. Well, that's growth. A, 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 that's not proficiency. So in other words, the growth they're making is in growth. The proficiency is if an arbitrary reached, standard. If they've reached a level, the proficiency is if they've reached a, a like third grade level for reading, etc. No, I'm talking you? about the debate between proficiency and growth. Yes. And what, what your thoughts are on them. Well, I, I was just asking to clarify then. Well, this is, this is a subject that is, has been debated in the education community for years. In and I've, I've advocated growth as the chairman and every member of this committee knows because with proficiency, uh, teachers uh, ignore the kids at the top mm -hmm. who are not going to fall below proficiency and they ignore the kid at the bottom who no matter what they do will never get to proficiency. So I've been an advocate of growth. But it surprises me that you don't know this issue. And Mr. Chairman, I think this is a good reason for us to have more questions. Because this is a very important subject, education, our kids' education. And I think we're selling our kids short by not being able to have a debate on it. Well, in terms of throwing numbers around, you said that uh, student debt has increased by a thousand percent since nine hundred eighty percent in eight years. I'm sorry. Nine hundred and eighty percent. That's not. That's, that's just not so. It's increased one hundred and eighteen percent in the past eight mm. years. Well. So I'm, I'm. I'm just asking if you're challenging my figures, I would ask that you get your figures straight about education policy, and that's why we want more questions. Because we want to know if this person that we are entrusting, or may entrust to be the Secretary of Education, if she has the breadth and depth of knowledge that we would expect from someone who has that important, uh, that, that important job. And I was kind of uh, surprised, well, I'm not that surprised that you did not know this issue. Mrs. DeVos, your family has a long history of supporting anti-LGBT causes, including donating millions of dollars to groups that push conversion therapy, the practice of trying to change someone's sexual orientation or gender identity. For example, you and your family have given over $10 million to Focus on the Family, an organization that currently states on its website that, quote, homosexual strugglers can and do change their sexual behavior and identity. Mrs. DeVos, conversion therapy has been widely discredited and rejected for decades by every mainstream medical and mental health organization as neither medically nor ethically appropriate. It has been shown to lead to depression, anxiety, drug use, homelessness, and suicide, particularly in LGBT youth. In fact, many of the leaders and founders of conversion therapy, including both religious ministries and mental health professionals, have not only publicly renounced it, but have issued former, formal apologies for their work and how harmful it has been to the individuals involved. Mr. Chairman, I would ask that this be included in the record. It will be.